2 Samuel 6, and we're going to look at the entire chapter here, addressing, there's two particular specifics in this chapter that I want to look at, and both really are around the, the issue of David bringing the Ark of the Covenant back up into the city of Jerusalem. You remember David has just become king. The previous chapter we looked at, he was anointed king over all of Israel. And the first thing that David wants to do is to bring the Ark of the Covenant back to the city of Jerusalem and bring it to the center of Jewish worship. And so there's a problem that takes place. A man dies as the result of touching the Ark of the Covenant. Many times people read this and they say, Steve, I don't get that. And then the second part of this chapter deals with not a breach between God and David, but between David and his wife, Michael. And so both of, the, of these issues are, are focused around the issue of the return of the Ark of the Covenant. So read with me these first few verses here of chapter 6. Again, David gathered all the choice men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Ballet, Judah, to bring up the Ark of God, whose name is called by the name, the Lord of hosts, who dwells between the cherubim. And so they set the Ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, drove the new cart. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill, accompanying the ark of God. And Ahio went before the ark. Then David and all the house of Israel played music before the Lord on all kinds of instruments made of fir wood, on harps, on stringed instruments, on tambourines, on sistrums, on cymbals. And when they came to uh, Nachon's threshing floor, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah, and God struck him there for his heir, and he died there by the ark of God. And David became angry because the Lord's outbreak against Uzzah. And he called the name of the place Peruz Uzzah to this day. David was afraid of the Lord that day. And he said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? So David would not move the ark of the Lord with him into the city of David, but took it aside and into the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. And it was told King David, saying, The Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with gladness. And so it was when those bearing the ark of the Lord, notice this phrase here. We're going to come back to this. When those bearing the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, they sacrificed oxen and fatted sheep, and, the, and David danced before the Lord with all his might, and David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. So you have to picture this particular scene in your mind. David consults the men of Israel. He goes and 30,000 men come with him. Now they're obviously, they're going down into the Philistine country. This is the reason why he took all of these warriors with him because they just had a war with the Philistines. And so they are very near to the border with the Philistines. 
So he takes these people down and it says all Israel. So multitudes of people came out of villages and towns surrounding this area and they're lining the, the road there up to the city of Jerusalem. David brings the Ark of the Covenant out, puts it on a cart. These two men drive it. The oxen stumble. He puts out his hand and he is struck dead there for touching the Ark of the Covenant. And so when you see this scene, all of a sudden, all of the joy, all of the praise, all of the excitement, it just, it's, it goes sour. Everything just stops. And David is afraid. And he's saying to himself, what should I do? And so he puts the Ark of the Covenant into a man's house, and it resides there for three months. But he hears that this man's house is being blessed because the ark is there. And so what happens is, as we read in First Chronicles, we read that David then inquired of the Lord and asked the Lord what had he done wrong. And he acknowledges, we'll read it in the text here in just a moment, exactly what he did wrong brought the Ark of the Covenant up into the city, and finally put it into the tabernacle that David had built. Now you're saying to yourself, okay, why did this guy die for touching the Ark of the Covenant? I mean, he had great intentions. He had good intentions, didn't he? He didn't want the Ark of the Covenant to fall on the ground or something when it's shaking around on this cart. I mean, you know what it's like to ride on a dirt road. And so he stretches out his hand, tries to hold the ark in its place, and he is struck dead. And you say, I don't get that. Lord, why would you do such a thing? Well, this really is for two reasons here. The first reason is the reason that I don't think as Christians we really truly understand, and that is the holiness of God. The holiness of God is a separateness because of his purity. And everything in Jewish worship was to communicate to people that he was holy and he was separate from them and they could only approach him in the manner he prescribed. And if men did not follow those directions, they would pay the consequences. Let me explain it to you. There's this tent that God said to build. It's called the tabernacle, but it's just a big tent. That's all it is. This tent was to house two particular portions. The first place was called the holy place. The second portion of this tent was the holy of holies. In this outer area of the, uh, or the first area of the tent, the, the holy place was where the priests would do their, uh, their, they would pray in this particular area. They would um, communicate with the Lord and acknowledge his holiness. Inside of the holiest of all was where the Ark of the Covenant was. Now, probably many of you have seen Raiders of the Lost Ark. And there's some things that are good in that movie, and there's th some things in there that are wrong and not biblical. But what was correct was what the ark looked like. They truly ren render what the ark actually looked like. It's just a box about two by three feet. It was overlaid with gold. It had two angels or cherubims facing each other over the top of this box, and their wings touched each other in the center. And then there was a, a, a lid on the box, and that was called the mercy seat. If you lifted up the lid, you could look inside, and there would be the Ten Commandments. There would be a jar of the manna that they had eaten in the wilderness, and there was the rod of Aaron that budded. So those three things were there inside this ark. But above the mercy seat were the 
cherubim were, this is where the Shekinah glory of God dwelt. It was an actual glowing presence that was visible to the naked eye. We know that because of what the scripture says in reference to the ark and when the high priest would go in once a year to offer the blood of the sacrifice for the sins of the nation. So, one man, once a year, goes into the Holy of Holies and there meets with God. If anybody else goes into that area, they would be struck dead because that is the only individual that could approach God because he sanctified himself. Now, the reason why I declare this to you is that right here in our text is a statement that many times, again, people do not understand. Notice verse 2. It said, David wants to bring up the ark of God whose name is called by the name, the Lord, the, the Lord of hosts, who dwells between the cherubim. So the cherubim obviously is a reference to the ark of God, these cherubim on top of this box, and there the presence of God dwells, but he is called the name. Now for Jews, this is the only way they would refer to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They would not call him by his personal name, not because the scripture told them they could not mention his name, but they chose out of reverence for his name not to speak his name with their unpure lips. You remember Isaiah, the Lord cleansed his lips because he said, I am an, a man of unclean lips. So the Jews said, we are not going to even speak his name. We're just going to call him the name. So the people of Israel had a tremendous reverence for who God is and what he is like. Notice this word, the Lord of hosts. The word Lord here is in all capital uh, letters. Most of the, the versions that you have today, when you see all capital letters, that is the actual personal name of God. And it is pronounced, one, one believes that it's pronounced Jehovah, others believe it is pronounced Yahweh. But either way, this is the name, the personal name of God. Now, why is that important? Because every God has a name. And gods ask to be worshipped in different ways. So when you look at the false worship of Baal, the false worship of Molech or Milcom or any of the other gods, there are a multitude of them referred to in Scripture. They all require worship in a different way than the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob requires. Not according to the law of Moses, but according to their law, their prescribed manner. Baal required the sacrifice of the firstborn child. Quite different from the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God said that this was the reason why he destroyed the children of Israel and put them into captivity is because of the destruction of their children. He said this was an abomination to him. So, I say all of this to you because many today say that Allah and the God of the Bible are one and the same. They are not. They are two different gods. When you read the Quran, which I have done, the requirements of the God of the Quran are different from the requirements of the God of the Bible. Different because they're different gods. So when you hear people make the statement, well, Allah, Jehovah, it doesn't make any difference, they're all the same God. They are not. And you need to correct that when you hear it. 
because it is essential that people understand that there is only one true and living God and all the rest are false gods that, ha that require men to do really crazy things. And when you read the Quran, you realize the requirements there are completely different from what the Bible declares. So, this was the attitude of the writers when they wrote this particular story. They wanted everyone to remember the holy God that dwelt among and between the cherubim. He was the name, Jehovah of hosts, or Yahweh of hosts. It says in Exodus chapter 3, verse 13 through 15, there Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Moreover, God said to Moses, You shall say to the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of ja Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. So, here the Lord declares his name to be I am. Now, why does he use I am and not Jehovah? Well, both these terms mean the same thing. It means the self-existent one. The term I am is very clear. He is ever-present. He's not I was. He's not I will be. He says I am. I am a self-existent God. I always have been. I always will be. I am from eternity past to eternity future. And so he is the self-existent one. And he has a name which is above every name, that at his name every knee should bow. This is what Paul declares in Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. This particular concept comes from the Old Testament passage of Isaiah 45, verses 22 and 23, where he declares the exact same thing. You must confess his name, his lordship over you. If you confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and that God has raised him from the dead, he said, you shall be saved. And so you must confess his name and your belief in his name. And this is what brings salvation. Now, so this is the point, truly, that this story is trying to establish. It's trying to declare to you this is a holy God and the people would declare him to be the name because of their reverence for him. But what David does here, secondly, this man dies. First, because the people do not recognize his holiness. Secondly, he dies because they did not approach him in the manner that he requires. How do we know this? Well, first, David makes a grave mistake, and that is that he consults the people of the land, the leaders of the land, but he does not consult the Lord. Very important. If you look at the chapter just previous to this, in our last study, what did I bring to your attention? David inquired of the Lord and said, what should I do? David inquired of the Lord, what should I do? And he did this, and yet in this particular case, he does not do that. And that is David's failure. He does not look to the word of God, and he consults men instead of consulting God. How do we know that? Well, in First Chronicles, there is a parallel story. This is the very same story that we have here, only Chronicles gives greater detail of what took place here. So just like the Gospels tell the same story and many times will give you greater detail, 
First and Second Samuel, First and Second Chronicles are very similar to each other. Not identical, but similar. And so in First Chronicles, in chapter 13, verse 1 through 4, notice, it says there, David consulted the captains of thousands and hundreds, and with every leader, David said to all the assembly, if it seems good to you, Notice, to you, and if it is of the Lord our God, which means that there was a little question in his mind. He said, let us send out to our brother and everywhere who are left in all the land of Israel and with them to the priests and Levites who are in the cities and their common lands, that they may gather together to us. Let us bring the ark of our God back to us, for we have not inquired at it since the days of Saul, which was over 40 years. Then all the assembly said that they would do so, for the thing was right in the eyes of all the people. So David here was being a little politically correct. He was more concerned about what was right in the eyes of people than he was in what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Now, you read on a little bit in First Chronicles 15, verses 12 through 15. And notice what David says. After he realizes that God is blessing the house of Obed-Edom, and he says, I want to bring him back, I want to bring the ark up again, I want to try a second time now. Notice what he says. First Chronicles 15, 12. He says, you are the heads of the father's houses of the Levites. Sanctify yourselves, you and your brethren, that you may bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel to the place I have prepared for it. For because you did not do it the first time. So there's the first problem. Uzzah and Ahio were not Levites. So they shouldn't have been doing this to begin with. Okay, so he's saying, you guys did not do it the first time. Secondly, he says, the Lord our God broke out against us. Why? Because we did not consult him about the proper order. So here David acknowledges his fault. He did not consult the Lord. He just consulted the leaders of the land. And then he says, so the priests and the Levites sanctified themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel. And the children of the Levites bore the ark on their shoulders by its poles, as Moses had commanded according to the word of the Lord. So what was correct in Raiders of the Lost Ark is when Indiana Jones finds the ark, supposedly, what do they do? Well, there's rings on this ark, and they put these wooden poles through it because that was the way God ordained that it should be carried. It was to be carried on, their, on the shoulders of the priests, and they were not to touch it. So what does David do? He puts it on a cart. Now, that sounds, if you read back in 1 Samuel, that's exactly the way the Philistines sent the ark that they had captured back to Israel. So what David did was he elected to use the Philistine method of transportation instead of the biblical me method of transportation. So here is the second fault that he does. And then this man touches it, which is a no-no. Now it's interesting, if you read the scripture in, in Numbers and Leviticus, you find that there were specific ways that God said you are to transport the ark, the uh, table of showbread, all of the articles within the, the temple, all of these articles of worship. He says you have to transport these in a specific way. Now, there the Lord says... If you want to see this, it says in Numbers chapter 4, verse 6, he says, Then they, referring to the priests, shall put on it, referring to the Ark of the Covenant, a covering of badger skins, and spread over that a cloth entirely of blue, and they shall insert its poles. So the priests were to go in, 
They were to insert these poles into the rings. They were to cover it with badger skins and then take this blue cloth and lay it over the top of it. Then the Kohathites, who were Levites, were to come in, and their job was to carry it. But they couldn't see it, nor could they touch it. If they saw it, they would die. If they touched it, they would die because of the holiness of God. It says in Numbers chapter 4, verse 15, When Aaron and his sons have finished covering the sanctuary and all the furnishings of the sanctuary, when the camp is set to go, then the sons of Kohath, Levites, shall come to carry them. But they shall not touch any holy thing lest they die. If you go on to verse 20, it tells them in that same chapter, if they see it, they will die. So it's very clear what God is declaring here. So this man dies for two reasons. First, David and Israel itself, all the people that are gathered, they do not reverence or respect the holiness of God and the requirements of his word. And then, secondly, he, they die. This man dies because he does not approach the Lord in the manner he requires. It says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 6, verses 15 and 16. Now we're talking New Testament. Notice here what Paul says, and I believe every one of us in this room should take heed to understanding the holiness of our God. Paul here speaking about Christ's coming. He says, which he will manifest in his own time. He who is the blessed, the only potentate, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, dwelling in an unapproachable light, whom no man has seen nor can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Now, this is talking about the actual essence of God. If you were in heaven itself, this is what you would see, an unapproachable light that no one can see, no one can approach. It is unapproachable. And you say to yourself, well, you're making me feel like I'm as far away from God as I can possibly get this morning, Steve. That's the point. And that is the point of the tabernacle. That is the point of these passages. Every one of us in this room is as far away from God as you could possibly ever be, except through Jesus Christ. You see, there is the solution. You see, the unapproachable God is approachable only as he has prescribed through Jesus Christ. That is what the New Testament declares. The unapproachable God is only approached through Jesus Christ. That is why Peter said there is no other salvation, no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus said no man comes to the Father except through me. That's pretty clear. So the reason why I am pointing this out this morning is to let you know God is approachable through Christ. The one who cannot be seen, cannot be touched, cannot be handled, is available to you through Jesus Christ. This is why in 1 John 1.1, 1, 1, this is why John is so excited about Christ. Let me read it to you. He says, that which was from the beginning. Now he's referring here to Christ. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. Wow. Well, there it is. You see, John understood the holiness of God, that he was unapproachable, untouchable. You could not approach him lest you be consumed. And he realizes Jesus Christ came into this world and he walked among us, and John said, I sat, I sat next to him. 
I saw him. I talked with him. I touched him. The untouchable, unapproachable God who dwells in a light that would consume you in a second came in the flesh of a man. Now, we're about to celebrate the Incarnation. This particular text makes that pretty clear. An unapproachable God came to approach you, to approach me, that he might save us. Now, the last thing in this text I think is important is the blessing on the house of Obed-Edom. You have this incredible downer that takes place trying to bring the Ark of the Covenant up. This guy dies. And David goes, I'm not doing anything more until I get some further direction here. He hears there's a blessing upon this man's house, and he thinks to himself, well, if God's blessing this guy with the Ark in his house, I want that blessing up here in the city of Jerusalem in this capital. I want him, I want the Ark here. I want the presence of God here. I want that blessing here. And so he elects to make a second attempt to bring the ark up to Jerusalem. And it's successful. This is what reveals God's severity, the killing of this man, because he touches the ark. And the goodness of God as he blesses the house of Odeb Eam. It says in Romans 11.22, Therefore consider the goodness and severity of God. You have to consider both of those. There is severity because of his holiness. There is goodness because of his grace. So you have to keep those two very balanced in your concept of God. And that is why this is, this is revealed and recorded here for us. Now, the second issue is the breach here between David's wife, Michael, and himself. Let's read verse 16. And as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and whirling before the Lord. And she despised him in her heart. So they brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had erected for it. Then David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And when David had finished offering burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. Then he distributed among all the people, among the whole multitude of Israel, both women and men, to everyone a loaf of bread, a piece of meat, and a cake of raisins. So all the people departed, everyone to his house. Then David returned to bless his household. And Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How glorious was the king of Israel today, uncovering himself today in the eyes of the maids of his servants, as one of the base fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. So David said to Michael, It was before the Lord who chose me instead of your father and all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord and over Israel. Therefore, I will play music before the Lord, and I will be even more undignified than this and will be humble in my own sight. And as for the maid servants of whom you have spoken, By them I will be held in honor. Therefore, Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. So in other words, this was an unreconciled issue. David had nothing to do with Michael from this day forward. And this is the way the scripture declares that. Now, why does Michael despise her husband in her heart? That is a question you have to answer. And you, I think you can answer it from what we have revealed in the scripture. There are several things. First, I do not believe that Michael truly was a believer. And I say that for this reason. If you go back in 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 21, 
Notice here what Saul says as he is about to give Michael to David as his wife. He says there, and Saul said, I will give her to him that she may be a snare to him. So a man or a woman who is your spouse can be a snare to you. Saul saw something in his daughter that said to him, I'm going to give this woman to him because she is going to stumble him. She is going to bring him down. So what was it? The scripture doesn't say. Except for one item we read in 1 Samuel 19, 13. Michael took an image and laid it in the bed. Now this is in the story where she is told David, you know, hey, the, the men are coming to, to kill you that are sent by my father. Get out of here. And she takes an image that she has, an idol, and she puts it in the bed and covers it up like that's David, so he can get away. So why did she have an idol in her house? And secondly, why would David allow her to have an idol in the house? But the question is, is that idol, where did she get it? You see, where is Michael at spiritually? I, I have great question in my heart that she was in love with the Lord like David was in love with the Lord. And I believe that anybody that you marry, that is the first thing you have to determine is do they love God like you love God? Because that's the, that's the key issue in every marital relationship. That's what makes it successful. That's what enables you to get through the difficulties that you go through, the problems with selfishness and all of your different personality issues. It's the Lord. That's the key. It is the fundamental key. And so, secondly, I think that David forced Michael to come back to him, and she had bitterness towards him. You say forced him, forced her to come back to him. What do you mean? Well, if you read earlier in 2 Samuel, or excuse me, earlier in 1 Samuel, when David fled from Saul, he took off, he went off into the wilderness, he left his wife there in the city of Jerusalem, Michael, and what did Saul do? He took her and he gave her to another man to marry. Does, did he have the right to do that? No. Did Michael have to marry this other man? No. But she did it anyway. She was an obedient daughter to her husband or to her father. But she shouldn't have done this. And so when David becomes king, he said, I'm not going to come and be your king until you give my wife Michael back to me. And so he forced her to leave this man and come to him. As you read the story, it was a pretty emotional time. It was, it probably brought great bitterness into the heart of Michael. And so with all of these issues, she looks at David and his worship of God, and she just despised him in her heart. She hated him. To despise someone means that you've got resentment. And so someplace over some issue, she was holding resentment. And that resentment is what destroyed their marriage. So for you, if you have resentment in your marriage, you need to deal with it. If you've got resentment in a relationship with anyone, you have got to deal with it. And you've got to deal with it in your own heart. And we have addressed this in the life of David over and over again you will see this is part of the theme of this story. Addressing resentment. Deal with it. It is an essential thing. You need to make every effort to resolve the conflicts that you have with people. Now, it takes two to resolve an issue. It cannot be done by one individual. It, has, it takes two. That's what a marriage is. Jesus said this in Luke 12, 58. 
referring to conflicts. He said there, when you go with an adversary to the magistrate, make every effort along the way to settle with him, lest he drag you to the judge and the judge deliver you to the officer and the officer throw you into prison. Now that's the simplest principle you can take in reference to conflict. Make every effort to get the issue settled. Now, if you make every effort and someone doesn't respond, well, you're off the hook. But you have to make every effort. If you don't make every effort, then you are rebelling and sinning against the Lord. So you have to do what you are called to do. To, to attempt that is your responsibility before the Lord. Now, secondly, here in this story, I think it's interesting to note David's response to this despising of him. The response here is very important. David here is being criticized by his wife. So what is he going to do? Oh, I'm sorry, honey. I, I won't do that again. Uh, you know, I, I, I won't get too as excited about the Lord as... Uh, no, he doesn't say that. Notice the very first thing he says. I think this is very important. It was before the Lord. So David here boldly responds to her. And he says, honey, I'm sorry. This is before God that I was worshiping. And that's the bottom line. And he makes no apologies here. He does not cower before her and try and just smooth everything over. Let's placate her and make everything, you know, fine. No, he says, this is right. This is what God deserves, is worship. Exuberant worship in this manner. And then, notice also, he does not remind Michael of her sin, of going to be the wife of another man. She could have gone to jail. She could have been put to death by her father. That's what she should have done instead of becoming the wife of another man at the pleading of her father. She was already married to David. And so her fault is clearly there. But notice David doesn't throw it in her face. Very important. That is one of the most unfair, unloving things that people do with each other is they throw the other person's sins in their face. And I'm telling you, that will destroy your relationship. If you want to respond in a godly, in a correct way, you need to listen to the criticism and determine, do you have a right conscience here? Have you done the right thing? If not, then you need to repent. If you have done the right thing, you need to stand boldly with the testimony of your own conscience and say, I'm sorry, I did this correctly before the Lord. Criticism by uh, Warren Worsby, one of my favorite authors, said this about criticism. He said, criticism can be a good thing. He said it either helps you if it is correct, or if it is incorrect, you can help them. I like that. You see, criticism is a good thing. It really is. Because it, it stops, it makes you evaluate and reevaluate your heart, your attitude, what you've done. And you need to do that whenever you're criticized. Don't just blow it off. Say, okay, did I do that? Okay, I, yeah, I did do that. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. No, I didn't do that. And if you check your motives out and your motives are correct and right, then you need to stand and be bold about that and not apologize for it. Don't apologize for something you didn't do. I hear Christians do that all the time. And I'm telling you, you will beat yourself up after you do it. After you apologize for something you didn't do, just to placate someone, you have dishonored the Lord because you've just admitted to something you didn't do just to keep peace. That's not what David does here. He stands on the truth of his own conscience. 
This is what Paul said in his epistle when of 2 Corinthians. Now, you remember the Corinthians, they charged Paul with everything you can imagine. They charged him with evil motives. They charged him with lying. They charged him for, you know, not taking money from them and uh, not taking a salary from them. They charged him for everything they could do. Now, Paul responds this way, 2 Corinthians 1, 12. He says there, for our boasting is this, the testimony of our conscience, that we have conducted ourselves in the world in simplicity and godly sincerity. So he is establishing here right at the get-go in this epistle, I, I've got sincere motives in my heart, and my own conscience is what testifies to me that this is, I've done the right thing. He goes on in 2 Corinthians 12, 19. This is, again, after Paul has been charged with lying and impure motives. He said, do you think that we excuse ourselves to you? We speak before God in Christ, but we do all things, beloved, for your edification. Notice, we speak before God in Christ. He goes on to say, let me read you a couple more passages. 2 Corinthians 11, 11. He said, after being charged for not taking a salary from them, he said, why? Because I do not love you, God knows. 2 Corinthians eleven thirty one. 31. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. So where is Paul placing his confidence, the testimony of his own conscience, and that God knows the truth? So sometimes when you try and reconcile a conflict with another person, and they blow you off, and they say, ah, get out of here. You did that. And you say, no, I didn't do that. Yes, you did. Where are you, are you going to be upset for the next year because they didn't acknowledge your apology or your acknowledgement of your, uh, your truthfulness or what you did right? Are you going to be all upset about that and just go, nobody believes me? Or are you going to say, Lord, you know? Are you going to rest in the fact that God knows? You see, truly, that is where freedom lies. If your conscience is saying you did the right thing, then you need to stand on that. God does know, and you have to stand upon that fact, that truth. And don't go apologizing for something that you didn't do. David here declares that he would continue to be humble in his own sight. And this is what a humble man does. He acknowledges his heart, his truth, the truth of what has taken place. He said the common people here are going to honor me for what I've done. Just normal, everyday people are going to see that, you know what, this was the right thing to do, to acknowledge the Lord and to worship before him as we bring this Ark of the Covenant in. So don't, don't let you know, someone's disbelief rock your world. You've got to stand on the truth. If you've done something with impure motives, then acknowledge it, ask forgiveness. Jesus warned us in Matthew 6, verse 1, he said, take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So make sure that you're doing things with a right motive. Examine them. Look at them honestly. If you see something incorrect, ask the Lord to change it. Ask him to forgive you. And ask him to empower you to do the right thing. But if you have done it with the right motive, honestly, sincerely, with godly sincerity, then don't apologize for that. I guarantee you that will not 
That, that doesn't lead you in a, in a correct path. That's not the truth. And the truth is more important than many times a relationship. The truth. And that is what takes place here in this particular story. So I encourage you this morning, take these principles, let the Lord put them and, and apply them into your life. Amen? Amen? Let's go to him in, in prayer. Father, we thank you this morning that, Lord, you are a holy God. And, Father, you are different than every other God on this earth that is worshipped and served by men. And, Father, we ask you to open our eyes to your holiness, your goodness, and your grace. Lord, open our eyes to who you are and what you're really like. Lord, we thank you for sending Christ to walk among us, God come in human flesh. Lord, that we might be able to see what you're really like. And so, Lord, we, we thank you for that. And, Father, we thank you for the opportunity to approach you through Christ. And so, Lord, we take that op opportunity, that, that open door that you have given to us, Lord, and we want to come in. And we want to have fellowship with you. Lord, draw us into that place of fellowship. Lord, make us men and women that are holy in our hearts, in our motivations, and our behavior. Cause us to follow you. And if you're here this morning and you don't know Christ, you've, you've never made a commitment to him. You have been doing your own thing, living on your own. Are you willing to respond to him this morning and turn your life over to him? You see, you must approach him through Jesus because you acknowledge his sacrifice for your sins. And you've got to be willing to turn from your sinful lifestyle. Do you want to do that? I don't want to let you go here to today without giving you an opportunity. If you're here and you want to follow him today, you want to turn your life around. You want to follow Christ. And you want to come in and have that fellowship with him that I've been talking about this morning. I want you to pray with me right now. If you're willing to turn and to follow him and turn away from your way of living, and obey him, then pray with me right now. And just say, Lord, I acknowledge my sin. I have broken your law. Forgive me. Jesus, come in, take over my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit right now. I want to know you. I want to follow you. Are you praying that prayer right now? Did you just pray with me? If you did, I want you to acknowledge that you prayed with me by lifting your hand here. God bless you. Anyone else here this morning? God bless. Anyone else? Lord, we just pray that you would just touch these hearts. Lord, I pray that you would bring that, Lord, that transformation of heart that only you can bring. Lord, fall by your spirit right now. Bring f forgiveness, bring healing, bring, bring that transformation, Lord. That empowering of your spirit to change these lives, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We give you praise today for who you are. A mighty, awesome, and holy God that loves us and wants to have fellowship with us. We give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen.